First at five, the Bear County Medical Examiner has identified a 19-year-old man killed in an early morning shooting as Aiden Hoffman. He was a former football player at Madison High School and was signed to play at West Texas A&M University. Police say he was shot while pulling into a parking lot on O'Connor Road around 12:30 this morning. They say after he was hit, he crashed into a curb and barrier. He died at the hospital. At last check, no arrests have been made. Well, do you recognize these two men? San Antonio police say they robbed a man outside a Home Depot on Fair Avenue earlier this month. It happened back on December 5th. Police say a man was walking to his car when the suspects pulled up in a white Chevy Suburban. One of them got out and then pointed a gun at the victim. They got away with some of his property. If you recognize them or have any information on their whereabouts, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. There's up to a $5,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. A 43-year-old corrections officer with the Kerr County Sheriff's Office has died following complications from the flu. Sheriff Rusty Hairholzer announced that death of Stephen Walters on Sunday. The sheriff writing on Facebook that Walters had come down with the flu a little over two weeks ago, but then complications set in and he was hospitalized. In a phone call with KSAT today, the sheriff called the father of four an excellent corrections officer. He said he did not know if Walters had had the flu shot. I'm just, uh, you know, very proud of the staff we have, and it, and it affects us all when one of our family members is passing the flu. And, uh, you know, I would just also encourage everybody to get the flu shot. Here in Bear County, we have had one child die so far from the flu this season, and flu-related activity is up over this time last year in the county and across the state. We'll have more on that coming up at 6 o'clock. Well, today, Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar confirmed he has ordered a full audit of current employees to make sure all background checks are accurate. This after a civilian employee was arrested for a shooting that happened on Saturday. Sheriff Salazar said Andrew Ramos was hired under a previous administration and according to current standards, he never would have been hired in the first place. Courtney Friedman sat down with the sheriff today to go over those hiring standards to see what has changed. 24-year-old Andrew Ramos was arrested over the weekend, charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon for allegedly shooting a relative outside a Northside strip mall on Saturday. Sunday, he was identified as a civilian employee with the Bear County Sheriff's Office. While reviewing his file, investigators found he was arrested for robbery in 2014. Court records show in 2015 the case was dismissed for insufficient evidence. Absolutely. Sheriff Javier Salazar yeah, said the previous administration hired him in 2016. Uh, sick and tired of getting embarrassed uh, by people that should have never been allowed to set foot in this building. Uh, and yesterday's arrest was a perfect example. He said under current stricter hiring standards, Ramos would have never been hired. In October of 2018, I made our, our uh, requirements a lot more stringent. That paper he handed over is this one, showing one main change. Previously, the background check only covered convictions. Now it covers all arrests, both misdemeanors and felonies. You may be a perfectly great person uh, that had one minor indiscretion and you were arrested and ultimately that case was dismissed. Um, I just can't continue to take that chance, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Out of 2,900 applicants this year, we've only hired 114. This stricter guidelines a response to continuous arrests within the department. This year alone, 18 BCSO deputies have been arrested for incidents that happened during their employment. Two civilian employees were also arrested. The numbers are down from last year when 26 deputies and three civilian employees were arrested. I won't be doing a touchdown dance anytime soon. I want that number down to zero. Currently, all deputies get new background checks every year, but in the past, that did not apply to civilian employees. Salazar's now changing that making the annual check apply to everyone. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And it was just a beautiful day outside. Taking a look at live cam, gorgeous shot of downtown San Antonio with those blue skies in the background. It was beautiful. If you could stand the higher mountain cedar count, we're in the middle of mountain cedar season and that pollen count is not looking pretty, but at least the temperatures are. Let's take a look at the weather watcher temperatures uh, and you can see that was 62 degrees in Warren's backyard in Del Rio, 66 for the high in Floresville in Michael's backyard. Zooming in a little bit further, some of our weather watchers probably still enjoying a little bit of a Christmas and holiday vacation, but we do have uh, Gary saying in West Kerrville it was 59 degrees. Now, starting tomorrow, we are going to have a weather change. Clouds first and then rain by New Year's Day. I've got a look at that forecast coming up in a few. Isis? Thank you, Sarah. 
New developments this afternoon in the latest anti-Semitic attack in New York. Federal prosecutors have filed hate crime charges against the suspect accused of slashing and stabbing five people who were celebrating Hanukkah inside a rabbi's home. As ABC's Trevor Alt explains, it's part of a frightening rise in attacks appearing to target Jewish people in the New York City area. The man accused of stabbing five people during a Hanukkah celebration Saturday is now facing federal hate crime charges. Prosecutors filing those charges Monday against Grafton Thomas two days after they say he entered a rabbi's home with a machete and started swinging wildly. So swinging is a sword, knife, I don't know what it was, back and forth hitting people. Police say after the attack, a witness spotted Thomas's license plate, allowing officers to track his car into Harlem. He was taken into custody, reportedly covered in blood. Thomas's family and attorney say he has an extensive history of mental illness, but no known history of anti-Semitism. My impression from speaking with him is that uh, he needs serious psychiatric evaluation, whether those manifested in anti-Semitism at a moment, I can't tell you. This afternoon, the criminal complaint detailing information uncovered by investigators that Thomas had handwritten journals referring to Nazi culture with drawings of swastikas and the Star of David, and his internet history included searches for German Jewish temples near me and why did Hitler hate the Jews. He also showed an interest in the black Hebrew Israelite movement, an ideology followed by the suspected killers in a shootout earlier this month in Jersey City, which killed six, including the two assailants. Both attacks part of 13 in the past month targeting people of the Jewish faith in the New York City area. Let's call it what it is. These people are domestic terrorists. We have increased security in this state. Uh, I think it's time to step up the law enforcement. One of those 13 attacks happened here in Manhattan. A 65-year-old Jewish man attacked by a man who reportedly shouted an anti-Semitic remark. That suspect is also now facing a hate crime charge. Trevor Ault, ABC News, New York. As the final hours of 2019 wind down, Democrats running for president attempt to end the year on a high note with more money and support for the new year. Nadia Romero is in Washington tonight to explain. Well, Tim, we're talking endorsements and dollars, and Joe Biden could be leading the pack. He definitely has the most endorsements, 32 from sitting members of Congress and governors. But everyone is scrambling to get as many dollars as they can on the campaign trail, and that's why we're seeing more attacks against him. Democrats running for president sprint towards 2020. We are so excited about this campaign. Uh, we would love if you could sign one of those commit to vote cards. Top-tier candidates in Iowa and New Hampshire attempt to get in front of as many early voters as possible. You decide who you let through the gate based on who you think can win, who you think can represent the values that uh, the whole party uh, stands for. It'll be you, Joe. Well, thank you. It's not just FaceTime, but also fundraising. As the clock counts down to the end of the campaign quarter, candidates ask for cash. Go to ElizabethWarren.com and pitch in five bucks. While people look ahead to the new year, Joe Biden is facing backlash for an old decision. He supported the worst foreign policy decision made by the United States in my lifetime, which was the decision to invade Iraq. In 2002, then-Senator Biden voted for the Iraq War Resolution, which ultimately led to the second Gulf War. Years in Washington is not always the same thing as judgment. Biden called his vote, quote, bad judgment, and defends the rest of his record. My whole career has been devoted primarily to foreign policy. As candidates spend the final hours of the year stomping on the trail, they have their sights set on what could happen in 2020. I believe that 2020 is our moment in history. So there's good news for Bernie Sanders. His camp just released his medical summary, and it shows that he's in good health. And that's important because he had that heart attack, remember, a few weeks back. And as we're just about 40 days until the Iowa caucus, all of the candidates will be on a rigorous path until then. Live from Washington, I'm Nadia Romero. Tim, back to you. Thank you very much. Well, now to an update on a story we first told you about earlier this month. It was about an auction company that discovered a purple heart and wanted to return it to the family of the person it belonged to. And today, that finally happened. Derek Scholl found the purple heart belonging to Charles Cook about 10 years ago and never found the owner. Well, with the help of the Order of the Purple Heart, Scholl returned the medal to Cook's son, Forrest, in a ceremony at the Purple Heart Memorial outside the Kadena Reeves Justice Center. 
I have a lot of memorabilia of my father, his flag and other medals, but I didn't have this original Purple Heart. So to get it back in the family is just tremendous. Mr. Cook says his father died five days before he was born in 1944. He says he looks forward to sharing the medal and the story with his grandsons.